Okay. Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, we hope that you had a very good uh, Passover and Easter holiday season, mm -hmm. which is uh, already blooming outside. Yeah. And <laughs> we're very on uh, very uh, happy to host uh, Dr. Han Andrew Anderson from the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a reader in physical geography in the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology at Newcastle University in the UK. His research focuses on reconstructing past climate using isotopes and organic geochemistry techniques on sediments from lakes and oceans. These proxies archives provide insight into the evolution of climate systems and track anthropogenic impact in aquatic environments. Recent work is focused on reconstructing late glacial hydrological variability on the Tibetan Plateau, Miocene and Pliocene and Pleistocene Paleoceanography of the Japan Sea, and human environment interactions in the UK. This afternoon, Dr. Henderson is joining us with a, a talk entitled Identifying the Drivers of Paleoceanographic Change in the Japan Sea since the mid Miocene. So for everybody, so remember that you can uh, wait for the end of the talk for uh, asking questions or just write them in the chat down there. So thank you, Andy, and the podium is yours. Okay, thanks, Nicholas. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to um, uh, give this talk. Um, I, I'm just gonna share the screen now, okay. Um, and okay, um, yeah, so as, as Nicholas has pointed out, I've, I've got kind of, I wear many hats and I originally started as a, a paleolimnologist. So I looked at, you know, lots of my work was in the Tibetan Plateau, looking at kind of lake sediment sequences uh, and trying to understand the age of monsoon system. Um, and uh, from that, there was an opportunity to participate in an IODP expedition, so the International Ocean Drilling Program expedition to the Japan Sea, which just sits um, further east than the Tibetan Plateau. And, and I was in, intrigued by this expedition, really, because, you know, it, it's kind of downwind of, of the Tibetan Plateau and what's happening in terms of the interactions between westerlies, um, the monsoon system, um, and I thought it'd be a good kind of counterpart to tr try and understand the system as a whole um, and see whether we can learn anything from the Tibetan Plateau and the Japan Sea and vice versa. Um, and so uh, the, the other thing about the Japan Sea is that it's it's a large uh, kind of system that's dominated by uh, like kind of biogenic production, um, and it's also quite a unique system, which I think probably by the end of this talk, I hope that you understand some of the the challenges and complications in terms of proxy understanding proxy reconstructions and, and how this fits kind of into the global picture of um of all of these changes so um this is just uh the the, the drill ship from that uh, iodp expedition so this is the geordie's resolution this is that tie up in alaska which is where we got on board before we transited to the north pacific to the japan sea okay so um, I thought I'd just give a quick kind of overview of the talk. So I'm going to introduce the Japan Sea, talk about some of its oceanography and what that means. Um, think about uh, Miocene sea surface temperature reconstructions um, and then talk a bit more about uh, the Japan Sea quaternary sediments. Um, obviously, you know, uh, some, you know, this research can't go full without acknowledging the kind of the input from um, both technicians, scientists, and crew from the IDP exhibition of 346, um, the Ocean Drilling Program, NERC, which is uh, our funder in the UK, Jamstec, which also had a couple of complementary cruises to help proxy understanding, obviously, my home institution, which is Newcastle University. So I'm going to start off by just giving you a quick overview of um, you know, where the Japan Sea is, what's kind of some of the things that we need to think about and consider. Um, and uh, this is a, a map, it's, it has a, a kind of a, a deep basin to the north here. Um, and these numbers here refer to different sites that were called during our expedition. 
Um, I'm, in particular today, I'm going to focus in on uh, U1425 and U1427. Um, but it's effectively a semi-enclosed marginal sea that's connected um, to the East China Sea down here um, via the, the Tsushima Strait, so the Tsushima Warm Current. Um, it's connected to the North Pacific, so we have the, this uh, Tsushima Warm Current that flows along the coast of Japan and flows out. And this brings in relatively warm, nutrient-rich waters into the Japan Sea, and we have a couple of offshoots of that as well, which affect kind of the near coastal system. But this current, this main oceanography, hugs the coastline of Honshu, which is the main island of Japan. Um, it's connected to the Pacific through the Sugara Strait, um, and this is mainly through kind of an outflow, um, and then connects up to the north to the Oktoks Sea via the Soya and um, Mamiya Straits. Now, the key thing about these straits is that they're really shallow. So the maximum depth at the Tsushima Strait is 140 meters. Um, and this is gonna have some bearing on how we think about uh, what happens, particularly during kind of glacial, interglacial shifts in um, and sea level. Um, so, oh, hang on, I'll step back. Uh, modern, modern surface waters um, are influenced by this uh, Tsushima warm current and all the different offshoots, and that's mainly coming from the Kuroshio current, which is one of the major currents that circulates water, kind of warm waters from the south towards the north of the Northwest Pacific. Um, this is a warm saline current and it mixes with less saline nutrient rich that comes from the East China Sea. Um, and overall it has a relatively low temperature Japan Sea with low salinity and high DO. And this is really maintained by um, a, what they call the Japan Sea proper water. So this is actually a deep water circulation system that forms in the north um, and is related to the kind of amounts of sea ice that you get from the from the north kind of further south. So if we think about its climatological atmospheric setting, um, we have uh, the Japan Sea over here on the right hand side of this diagram. And this is just really kind of a mocked up cartoon of you know, the way we think these patterns work. So the green, long green hour is when, when we're in a stadial mode, we have a big Northern hemisphere ice sheet. Um, this is um, how we see kind of westerly flow across, um, across the region. So westerly flow is forced for south of the Tibetan plateau because it's such a huge top topographic barrier. Um, you get contraction of the tropical region, you get movement of the westerly jet further south. When we're in uh, kind of an interstadial mode or an interglacial mode, we see that jet leap north of the Tibetan Plateau. We have much warmer moisture um, uh, air masses coming moving north to, uh, to above the plateau and that along with it brings moisture, which then triggers things like um, the East Asian summer monsoon system. So I want to kind of focus in on um, kind of looking at the Miocene to Pleistocene transition. Now, um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure we work across many, many time, uh, time scales. So just so that you kind of understand where we were coming from in terms of the things that we're kind of interested in. You know, the, the, the middle to late Miocene represents a really key stage in development of the Earth's uh, system, um, where you get this transition from peak warmth in the mid Miocene climatic optimum to intervals of transient uh, hemisphere glaciation here, so around about 2.8. So we have mid Miocene warmth we had here, and we had mid Pliocene warmth. And along the way, I've just on this diagram, we've plotted some of the major um, events that have been documented within lots of different records around the globe. So we start to see the deposition of, of opal silica in the North Pacific. We see continental aridity, which has been linked to C4 plant expansion. We have um, a number of tectonic events that occur. So we have particular that's really relevant here is we have the uplift of the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and it's this uplift certainly uh, around about 8 million years ago is thought to be one of the triggers in terms of kind of C4 plant expansion, the intensification of the Asian monsoon system. Um, and that's largely related to this kind of shift of how you control the westerly jet. If you put up something up in the atmosphere, you start to interfere with that uh, atmospheric circulation. Um, and one of our goals really from the Japan Sea was to expand the kind of spatial and temporal coverage of sea surface temperature records since the mid-Miocene. You know, this uh, cruise was back in uh, 2013. Since then, there's been lots 
of development of these sorts of records from the North Pacific in particular. Um, but because we had a, a semi marginally close base and right next to the um, Asian continent, it offered us an opportunity to look at what was happening on the continent as well as what was happening within the ocean. Um, and so the site I'm going to talk about is IDP 346 site U1425. Um, this, this was a, a kind of a large expanded system about 400 meters long. Um, and what it's really characterized by is this in the kind of the Miocene to Pliocene is the deposition of this kind of biogenic silica here, which is dominated by diatoms. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk a bit more about organic geochemistry. That's a kind of another ongoing project, but you can see that there's a, a number of kind of lithological changes that help define the different units within, um, within this uh, section. So, you know, some of the muds that we see are particularly in the kind of uh, middle Miocene, we start to see kind of these laminated events that we've kind of linked to um, changes in uh, productivity. Um, but what I want to focus on today is actually the sea surface temperature reconstructions. And what we use for this in terms of our organic geochemistry is a, a lipid biomarker bio called gly glycerol, dikyl glycerol tetraethers or GDGTs, which is a lot simpler to say. Um, and we um, we use the combination of the different types of GDGTs to, to reconstruct temperature. And this is an empirical relationship related to um, core top temperatures at the bottom of the oceans. Um, and the reason it's called TEX is because this is tetraethers with 86 carbon. So these have 86 carbons along here. Um, and this development only really occurred about 15, 20 years ago when it was kind of, they were kind of first recognized and their potential was exploited as a, a kind of a, a temperature proxy. And it's effectively the, the different ratios of the different types of GDTs to each other that then reflect temperature. They're produced by thermoarchaeota um, within the water column, but we also have a, a, a picture that's complicated because um, these are isoprenoidal and we have also branched GDGTs that are produced more by kind of soil based uh, microbes as well as kind of surface sediment based microbes. However, I'm painting a very simple picture and it's not as simple as that. Um, and there's probably another seminar we could give about all of the problems with some of the approaches and calibrations. Um, and I'll touch on a couple of those. So we're going to use TEX86 here to, um, to, to reconstruct sea surface temperature across the Miocene within um within the japan sea so what we have here is uh we have age um so this is kind of present day we have 18 million years ago here and what we see here are uh, the gdgt information converted into temperature using different calibration systems um, and this kind of highlights some of the problems that we have with using TEX86 is that depending on the calibration you use, you can sometimes get a very different story. So one thing I want you to kind of, um, kind of highlight here is that if we look at this TEX L86, um, you can see certainly in the last six, seven million years ago, we have a very different story compared to the, the, the black, the green and the orange symbols, which are up here. Um, and the problem here is that the orange is the original text calibration, as I've just shown you. Um, and the problem with using that is that it's, its range and applicability um, changes according to the temperature in which these uh, GGTs are produced. So you have to decide if you're in a, a kind of a low temperature area, such as the Arctic, then using text low is more appropriate. Whereas if you're in a, a higher temperature region, using text high is more appropriate. Um, and, but the problem comes when you're looking at a very long time period and you have switches in temperature and you know, tex lows upper limit is around about 15 degrees, tex highs upper limit is 30, but its lower limit is around about 15 degrees. And if you're thinking about well, which, which calibration do I switch between, it becomes a very difficult decision to make. Um, and then there was a, a kind of a, a mon modern analog tech technique using a Bayesian approach called using base bar, which is the, the green one. Um, and, and that actually matches quite well with the, the original TEX86. And what that does is it looks for kind of modern analogs in terms of kind of the structure of the um, 
the assemblage of GDDTs that you have in your sample and it tries to match it to surface areas where you have equivalent uh, distributions of the different GDDTs. So the problem with this is that it doesn't give us, if you know, given the, the vast difference between the different text um, approaches and calibrations, it doesn't give us confidence that we truly understand the changes in temperature and actually what the errors on those changes in temperature are. Because if we have to make an arbitrary decision to switch between one and the other, the question is, well, when would we do that? So um, I'm not sure how many of you will be familiar with um, uh, UK 37 index. This is a, a really well established uh, alkanone producer. Um, so these are kind of Emilio Huxley, I produce um, these uh, specific lipids or alkanones in their membranes, and these are related to temperature. And a lot of work's been done in terms of calibrating um, these uh, these lipid uh, biomarkers. And what um, what we see there is that that has an upper calibration problem as well at thirty degrees, but it can operate between zero and thirty with relatively no problem. The, the issue in the Japan Sea is that because of the extensive record that we're trying to look and reconstruct, UK 37 is produced um, by these uh, coccoliths. And the problem is that the, the, the producers don't appear or they don't evolve into producing the lipids of interest until around about 8 million years ago. So the problem is that if you want to look at kind of mid Miocene and beyond, you, you cannot rely on using UK 37. So the idea behind this was, well, if we can reconstruct TEX 86, we have more confidence in our calibrations for UK 37. So if we make the comparisons between the two when they both occur and then use that to get a sense of how good our TEX 86 is coming back. So if we look at this diagram on the right, um, this is uh, reconstructed UK 37 from surface sediments. This is reconstructed TEX 86 from surface sediments. And we can see there's about a two degree difference. So if UK 37 is 15, um, TEX 86 is about 17 degrees reconstruction. And this is a comparison to water column temperature. Um, and this dashed line here is mean annual temperature for the Japan Sea. So UK 37 is fairly close and it's kind of bracketed by both. So this kind of suggests that these are both reflecting mean annual temperature, but there is a big, there's a big difference between, you know, which one is more appropriate to use here. And TEX 86 seems to be weighted towards the summer, at least in terms of, and that kind of makes sense in terms of production. Um, so when we look at uh, the down core record and if we focus in on the last eight million years where we have all of this kind of uk 37 versus um, uh, versus our text record you can see there's actually some marked differences between um, the different records so here for instance we see you know we see a slow decline from about 12 million to 6 million years ago in terms of sea surface temperature um, we see a much steeper decline from eight to to about 5 million years ago. So this, this would represent the late Miocene moving into the Pliocene. Um, and that's a very different record depending on which sea surface temperature that you're using. So this obviously leads to problems in terms of well, which, you know, which, which temperature reconstruction do you trust? Are these differences a result of empirical calibrations? Is it because we have a mixed GDD single? So we start to see some terrestrial versus oceanic producers influencing our ratios of GDDTs that we haven't previously considered. I mean, the offset we see certainly in that period that this kind of hashed line period here is, is between about two and 10 degrees. That's quite a significant uncertainty in terms of you know, what's happening. Or is, does this reflect differences in the different environments in which these um, producers, these lipid producers are actually sitting. So, you know, building on this and some of the issues that, uh, and this isn't my work, this is where a colleague, uh, colleagues work in Birmingham University, so Tom Dunkley Jones and James Bendel, who um, have developed a, a machine learning approach for kind of GDT based paleo thermometry. And the, the, the advantages of, of this over an empirical core top calibration data set is that 
it creates an appropriate assignment of uncertainty. Um, and this is particularly appropriate for much deeper time in terms of things like the EFC, for instance, where you know estimates of sea surface temperature are actually based on the relationship of ancient the assemblage of the different GDDTs in the sediment to the modern calibrations data set. And the machine learns about where those data sets sit. Um, and it also helps to overcome things about making estimates beyond the range of the modern empirical calibration. So obviously if you are going into the year seeing where it's gonna be hotter than 30 degrees, it comes over that, but also it deals with a calibration that spans the whole data range. And what this is shown, this is the envelope of uncertainty here. The colors of the symbols that we see are to do with how, what's, how closely coupled it is to its kind of nearest calibration neighbor. And so we get two bits of information. We get the trends in changes in sea surface temperature, but we also see how confident we are of the data point actually representing the sea surface temperature that it says it does. And what we see from this record is that we start, we see some nice uh, mid Miocene warmth between 15 and 17 million years ago. Um, between 10 and 15 is a bit of a, a bit of a black box in terms of where only got one data point to support it. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, but we do see that transition from 10 to 5 million years ago is actually relatively steep from about just over 20 degrees to kind of modern day um, 5 degrees. Uh, and then the kind of the onset of kind of you know, the Pliocene and then this would be the quaternary period. And obviously the resolution there doesn't allow us to pick out anything like um, glacial into glacial cycles or anything. So this gives us a bit more confidence and, and this has just been published, but it, I think it went through quite several rounds of reviews with some, some criticisms from some of the quarters in uh, the different TEX86 groups. Um, but it offers an alternative way of looking at how we reconstruct temperature. So if we um, make that comparison um, and look at the changes in uh, kind of the, the optimal record here, which is the one in purple, so we have the warmth here, we have this um, decrease in um, temperature from about 10 million years ago. And we make a comparison to, um, to sea surface temperature from outside of the Japan Sea, but in the, you know, the North Pacific. And we look at the, the different IDPs and these represent different latitudes. So this is obviously the high latitudes and we have going towards the tropics. Um, we can see that, that we have the same decrease um, decreasing trend in uh, sea surface temperatures from 10 million years to, to 5 million years ago. Um, but within the Japan Sea record, we see a big shift around about 5 to 6 million years ago. Um, and, but we also have this kind of empty space here. And there's, there's a couple of things I want to explore there. Um, if we think about, you know, the trends look broadly similar in terms of temperature, but we see much more abrupt change within the Japan Sea. Now that could be to do with our proxy calibrations. And, um, but because the Japan Sea is a semi-enclosed basin, it's a pull-apart basin and it's actively tectonic, there's a number of things we need to think about and consider when we actually look at our sea surface temperature. It isn't just going to be solely about its interaction with different kind of ocean masses. So if we think, if we consider, um, kind of 16 million years ago here, we have evidence for really warm waters within the Japan Sea. And if we look at that within um, the North Pacific, there are warm waters. Um, and the gray zones here um, represent the paleo shorelines of these different islands. So you can see you have a, a young, youngish basin that's open to the North Pacific. So we're getting lots of exchange of warm waters. Um, we're seeing that over our, our drill site, which is uh, this site here. So that's the Yamamoto Basin. And these arrows represent warm currents, cold arrows represent cool currents. So we have a kind of a pseudo Toshima warm current, but not as we would probably recognize it in the modern day. Around about 10 million years ago, uh, when we start to see that jump, that move from very warm waters to much cooler waters, uh, about 5 million years ago, we see that we have the Toshima Strait here is blocked. So there's no interaction with kind of warmer surface waters and any warm waters is actually pushed out into the North Pacific. And we don't see that interaction within uh, the Japan Sea. And it then becomes dominated 
by cooler waters coming from the north and dominating this basin, probably from this Cenotox region. Um, so we have this kind of blockage, and this blockage has been created by tilting um, and also kind of exhumation of the Honshu Island um, uh, and, ch and, and changes in kind of the neo-tectonics or the tectonics of the basin. Then we would get to about three and a half million years ago. Um, we see the, the start of the connection of the modern day Japan Sea to um, East China Sea through the Tsushima Strait. Um, we see the Sagara Strait start, but we still have dominance from cool waters with some warmer waters coming in. So we start to see this kind of, you know, in between house. And then in the start of the Quaternary, about two and a half million years ago, we start to see the modern Tsushima Strait as it is, as we recognize it today. And we see much warmer waters come in. So we probably reflect that that's probably closer to what we see as the Tsushima warm current. Um, as is through the Tsushima Strait. So even though we have this connection here, the overall um, temperature as a result of kind of global temperatures is much cooler than it was in the mid Miocene. So what we're seeing here is evidence of um, global temperature changes being reflected within our sea surface temperatures, but that being complicated by changes in the actual basin in which the, the core sits and the temperatures that it's registering. So that it isn't just a simple um, carbon copy of what's happening in the North Pacific, but actually neotectonics is playing its role. So we have the establishment of what we understand to be kind of the modern oceanography of the basin around about two and a half million years ago. So that's the start of the Quaternary and that kind of segues quite nicely into kind of looking at Quaternary sediments within the Japan Sea, and I'm going to look at a different site here. So 1427. Now this um, this kind of builds on a lot of work that's gone on before by uh, Ryuji Tada and uh, the original ODP Leg 127 in the late 1980s, who who saw this this dark light layering of um, of the Japan Sea sediments in the Quaternary, and what they noticed is that you started to get this dark light layering even though it might be quite faint, you start to get that at the start of the Quaternary 2.5 to 2.6 million years ago. So when you start to see the Tsushima Strait open and you start to see a Tsushima warm current flow through, and then it starts to get enhanced around about 1.2, 1.3 million years ago, where it becomes much, much more pronounced. Um, and one of the hypotheses behind what drives this dark light layering within the Quaternary sediments is um, is it reflects changes in the amount of organic content within the dark light layers. Um, and they extrapolated this to think about, okay, well, what would drive that when you compare it to green and the grip cores and GISP2, they, they tend to vary in association with Danska Oscar cycles. So the question is, is this an imprint of what's happening in, in the North Atlantic? Now, if you think about that, connection via the Wesley jet stream, it, it, it's quite feasible that you could see that influence of the Wesley jet interacting with the different monsoons actually impacting what happens within the Japan Sea. Now, this is quite a complicated and convoluted mechanism, and I'll, I'll try and talk you through it as, as slowly as possible. Um, but effectively comes down to the different types of um, ocean that you have lying above your sediments. You either have a Yuxing type ocean, so you have really dark gray to black layers without any hue in them. Then you have, uh, they're very finely laminated in general and they have, they're rich in small framboidal pyrite. Now pyrite forms when you get really deep waters with kind of a lack of oxygen. And then you have your suboxic type. So you have kind of between suboxic to anoxic, you have kind of brown, brownish gray, you have they're coarsely laminated or highly biodiverted, so that tells us actually there's some productivity going on. They tend to be either diatomaceous or, or foram or nano rich, although that isn't the foram and nano rich isn't applicable across the whole of the basin. So what uh, Tada pr proposed is that it's all to do with the oxygen level of the deep deep water, and that changes from hyperoxic during interglacial maxima to eugenic during glacial maxima. Um, and those oxygen levels are controlled by the nutrient input from the Tsushima Strait, and that's controlled by the Yangtze River discharge, and that reflects East Asian summer monsoon precipitation. Um, and then the upwelling rate of the deep water, which is controlled by the production of 
the J Japan Sea proper water due to cooling and sea ice formation caused by the winter monsoon. So the, what they're trying to understand is, you know, the framework here is to understand in terms of the summer versus the winter monsoon system. And so this is the model that kind of the proposed. So on the left here, we have increase in sea level. So this is when you have uh, kind of low stands. This is when you'd have kind of much higher stands. So kind of interglacial versus glacial. And the idea here is that you have um, kind of a strong pink incline here um, where you have very limited exchange with the Tsushima Strait and East China Sea. Um, precipitation is greater than evaporation from this basin. Um, that means you get this kind of really strong freshwater lens that sits on top of a very uh, museonic condition, low oxygen environment. Um, we then have a couple of other modes that sit in, in between glacial and interglacial where we see um, kind of increase in lake uh, sea level with interaction with the Tsushima warm strait, you, but you get some winter cooling that creates the ice. So you get some um, Japan sea proper water, some overturning, and it, it kind of oscillates between this kind of oxic and suboxic state where you have high productivity that starts to use up oxygen and you start to produce um, a kind of a lower carbon organic layer. And then you have a slightly uh, higher sea level where you get oxic conditions, much stronger current, you get much higher productivity and you get higher dark layers and that's kind of suboxic to euxinic, um, but this sits within the, the two extremes and obviously when we have kind of um, kind of full glacial, we have hyperoxic, we have good overturning, we have winter cooling, but we also have a strong current and you get kind of a, a, a kind of a light layer. What that means in terms of surface productivity is that we see um, we see that surface productivity in deep water oxygenation and the accumulation of organic carbon of functions and nutrient influx and upwelling rate. So it isn't just about you know sea level bouncing up and down, but it's also to do with you know the oxygen level, where that oxygen is coming from. Um, where you think get things like you know an oxygen sag within the, the actual system and so we have different modes according to different so this is hyperoxic here where we have um relatively low productivity it's highly aerobic um because we've got a lot of kind of uh, low nutrient influx whereas um we have another mode here where it's anaerobic underneath because you've got lots of kind of high productivity at the top um and then you have kind of a slightly high productivity with aerobic and anaerobic conditions underneath. So you have this interaction of not only deep water oxygenation from the bottom, you have surface productivity, and these both affect um, carbon accumulation within the basin. And it's these that trigger that dark light layering. So kind of to demonstrate this point, um, this is a, a record from a uh, from the Marin de Frayne taken in 2001, um, where the, the, we have L star, um, which is a uh, kind of a color metric parameter that we use to look at um, kind of the photospectrophotometry of the, of, the, of the sediments. And the higher it is up here, the darker it is, and the lower it is down here, the lighter it is. So the idea is that if we have using the conditions, we have really we have it's kind of really low L star, and that should coincide with when we have kind of um, glacial maxima, where we have really kind of low stands. And we can see that we, our peaks here kind of correspond to when we have these kind of maxima. Um, and this kind of bounces up and down in terms of uh, when we, we see kind of uh, interglacials versus uh, stadials versus interstadials. Um, and these two points here represent tephra. So they kind of they they've been kind of independently um, calibrated in terms of uh, the ages of these things. And so, what the drivers are of this dark light layering is, if we think about these kind of interstadials, is that when we have an intensified summer monsoon during an interstadial, because we have warmer weather, um, warmer temperatures, this drives westerlies further north. It means we start seeing an increase in the discharge of the Yangtze. And this is just a uh, kind of sea surface um, salinity map of the Yang this is the Yangtze here. Um, we obviously have lots of fresh water coming out here, but this, the stronger that fresh water pulse, 
Um, this is uh, where the Tashima warm current comes in. We have the Kishura current here that brings up nutrients and these two interact and that drags in um, warm water and nutrients um, through the basin. So that expands the East China Sea coastal water. It interacts with the nutrient rich Kishura current and it's the influx of this low salinity nutrient rich East coastal water into the Tashima Strait that helps with that deposition of that kind of interaction with dark light layers. So sea surface salinity of the Northeast China Sea is a good proxy for East Asian summer monsoon. That in turn affects the oceanography that affects Japan Sea. So one of the problems with uh, the Japan Sea, and it's something that gets brushed under the carpet quite a lot, is that it has a very shallow uh, CCD, so um, carbonate compensation depth. And that has real problems in terms of preservation of carbonate microfossils. And normally when we approach um, paleoceanography, we like to uh, use benthic forams um, and look at their oxygen isotope and, and just uh, use that to create a stack that we can then compare to Lesiki Ramo. And that helps us to tune our record to a kind of a global vision of what, what happened when and where. Um, because we don't have that, we, we kind of sh struggle a bit in terms of trying to understand, well, you know, how you know, what the timing of some of these events are and actually is the interpretation that we're proposing is that, you know, is that spot on or is, is it more complicated than that because we haven't been able to provide an independent age model. The other problem in Japan Sea is that paleomagnetics are hampered by the amount of iron in the system and the formation of pyrite and iron nodules within the sediments. Um, and that is a particular feature in a number of these sites. So one of the goals of the expedition was to try and create a, a kind of a, an interbasin stratigraphy for all of these sites. Um, and the sites we're going to focus on are 14, 30, 25, 26, 24, 23, 22. All of these records, paleomagnetics didn't work um, in terms of looking for reversals in the paleomagnetics, but for some reason, 1424, it did. So we've, we, we've used basically 1424 as a kind of a master chronology based on paleomagnetics and its um, biostratigraphy, which are mainly reliant on rad radilarian and diatoms because um, forams and nanos kind of all dissolved by a couple hundred thousand years ago, which isn't any good if you want to look on a longer time scale. And, but the beauty of the Japan Sea is that because of this dark light layering, because it's a whole sea response, we can track those dark light layers across the whole of the basin. So at each site, we can correlate um, all of these different dark light layers to individual events across each site. So this was an effort to create what uh, our uh, Ryuji Tada used to call the perfect splice. So, you know, are there ways that we can splice all these records together, create one single chronology, and then basically use that to put it onto the different sites. And this is this effort, this is what this represents. And, you know, importantly, there's there's many tephras with known ages from on land that are, um, can also help constrain some of those, those age model problems in terms of um, paleomagnetics. And so what we've done here on the left-hand diagram, we have, uh, we have depth and we have age, um, and, and so this is uh, the 1424 um, age model just based on tephra and paleomagnetic data that we have for this site. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, we look at uh, the depth, um, but we also look at kind of these tephra and paleomagnetic data tie points against an inferred tuned record to the Siki Ramo and make a comparison. And what we can see is that using that tuning model, um, along with paleomagnetic and tephra, we can actually create a, a kind of a composite age model for certainly the last three million years, which is what, when the Siki Rainbow ran out, um, although it's now extended much longer. So what that does is it gives us confidence that we can actually have some form of kind of independent age control for our records within the Japan Sea, certainly over the last, uh, over the quaternary period. So, well, we've looked at 1424 and we've, we don't have the ability to reconstruct oxygen isotope composition changes. Um, one of the reasons we went to this site, which is close to the 
to the Japanese uh, coastline, 1427, is that it's relatively shallow. So it's um, 330 meters deep. And because it's shallow, it sits above the CCD. So the idea is that actually we should get preservation. So we shouldn't have all the carbonate scavenged out of these sediments. Um, and, and what we find is that actually we do get some really good preservation of four ounce uh, throughout the whole of this record. We have a really good nano record as well, which I won't talk about today. But what we see is that it, this site sits right underneath the Tashim Wall Current. So it allows us to actually track what's happening within the Tashim Wall Current. It also allows us to be really sensitive to things like changes in sea level and changes in salinity. The added complication is that it sits quite close to the coast. So we will get much more of a terrestrial signal kind of impacting um, what we're going to see. So here it is, it sits 330 meters just underneath this kind of um, bubble of kind of warm waters that are brought in by the Toshima warm current. So the first question we had was, well, can we actually take that and, and splice that to other records within the Japan Sea? So 1426 just sits to the north. Um, we can see that there's uh, tephra layers that we can actually uh, trace across uh, the, different, um, the different basins. Um, what you'll note here is that there's a number of tephra layers that we see within 1427 that aren't within the deeper basin, um, but we do see within the East China Sea system. So. There is some level of connection between what's happening just one side of uh, Honshu versus what happens just the other. Whereas in the deeper basin, it's either not being carried that far over or um, it's not, it's so thin and discreet that it's not very well represented. Um, and when we look at um, uh, 1427, this is uh, the kind of the long term uh, record. Um, we've used natural gamma ray counts and sediment color using B star rather than L star this time. And that's because it's correlated to, to productivity. So the B star profile is correlated to calcareous nanofossil abundance, and that's just based on shipboard data. Um, and we see a negative correlation between natural gamma ray within our sediments and B star, which tells us that sediment is being driven by changes in lithogenic versus calcareous biogenic components. So that tells us we're looking at a productivity signal here. And all of these things seem to be closely related to sea level. They don't exhibit the same kind of structure, but the, certainly the, um, in terms of the limits, but certainly in terms of what we're seeing and the changes we're seeing in terms of lithogenic versus calcareous biogenic productivity has been driven by sea level change. And that kind of makes sense because if you lower sea level and you cut off the Toshima wall current, it's not bringing nutrients, so therefore productiv productivity should crash. And we can see that this kind of continues, this pattern continues, this is a 500 meter record um, and stretches back to about 1.4 million years. So we see a really highly expanded section here compared to the other sites within the Japan Sea. And what's quite nice is we see a really kind of clear, distinct transition from um, relatively high, low amplitude frequency in terms of changes in sea level to one where we see much, much bigger changes. Um, and this is what we'd argue would is, is related to things like the MPT. Um, and I have a PhD student who's currently just finished and is finalizing her kind of corrections for her, her thesis on that. So we've got oxygen isotopes from 4M, so great, we can produce an independent age model using oxygen isotopes compared to the Sikiremo. But the problem with Japan C is it, it, um, the oxygen isotopes don't behave how you'd normally think in terms of, uh, this is just a test core from off the coast. So this is uh, just a 50,000 year core. Here we have the last glacial maximum. Now, normally the way oxygen isotopes work when we think about ice sheet control on sea level and oxygen isotopes is that you get really light values because all of the heavy oxygen is um, so you get really heavy values when all the ice and ice sheets have expanded because all of the all of the light oxygen isotopes are locked up in the ice and therefore the ocean is, is heavier because we have all of that evaporation as, as sea level falls down. But we have the exact opposite in terms of um, the Japan Sea. So what we see during when we would expect maximum, sorry about that, maximum growth in ice sheets is we have really light values within the forams, both within Boloides, which is uh, planktonic, and uh, Uvigerina, 
and uh, Casigulina as well. These are all heavy. So these two are benthic species and this is a uh, planktonic species. And really what this is reflecting is the, if you think about when we had sea level four, we had the oxygenic conditions or suboxic conditions, we had a lens of fresh water on top of those, on top of that, um, on top of the, of the sea, of, sea of Japan. Um, and it's that fresh water is what's been exhibited here. Because you've cut it off from oceanic um, exchange, you don't get the saline waters that are coming in. So you st any precipitation that occurs is being funneled into the basin and it creates a freshwater lens at um, that point in time. And if we go through time, we can see, you know, the same is true. We see uh, really light values when we would expect to see really heavy values in terms of um, in terms of kind of ice sheet dynamics. So here we have glacial maxima. This is Lesicki Rainbow here. This is 1429. So this is a, a record that sits in the East China Sea, and you can see it behaves as it should because it's connected to the open ocean. But as soon as you get into the Japan Sea, you close off the Tsushima Strait, you see the exact opposite. You see a peak and light values here when you would expect to see these low values here. So the orbital scale kind of oxygen and ice depth, particularly for the Japan Sea, over the late Pleistocene is not interpreted in a normal way. You know, the LR stacks, you should see heavier 18O, glacial conditions, low sea level. Lighter 18O, interglacial conditions, higher sea level. But the Japan Sea, we have the opposite, where we see heavier 18O, where we get interglacial conditions and high sea level, and lighter 18O, glacial conditions and low sea level. And the Japan Sea response is related to that isolation of the, the whole of the basin from the Pacific Ocean and the freshening of the seawater through kind of monsoon precipitation. And the likely cause of this is to be, is probably the switching kind of glacial into glacial amplitude. So if you think about the MPT, when we start to see this shift and we, um, we kind of get um, kind of bursts of it here where you start to, it starts to kind of marry up. But, you know, previous to the MPT, the actual shift between high and low sea levels, glacial into glacial is much, much smaller than you would when you get um, kind of this 100,000 year cycle of glacial into glacial in the last 800,000 years or so. So one of the goals of PhD students is to actually look to see whether it's it's something that switches after the MPT or whether it's actually just, um, it's it's a feature of the basin throughout the quaternary. And we know that um, that these these changes are happening because these are kind of nanofossil taxa that, that come from the Tashima current. And we see that we get peaks in the Tashima warm current after these uh, glacial maximas here. And when we look at those glacial maximas, we have no evidence of any Tashima warm current um, interaction. So that kind of tells us that we're, we're seeing the Tashima warm current being really cut off and that actually the idea that we're having this kind of freshening of the surface waters, which is pick, being picked up in terms of the oxygen isotopes um, in all of the other, in, in certainly in terms of benthic and planktonic forums. Uh, and that's again supported by Radilarian taxa, where you see the same sorts of um, relationships with, uh, with nanofossils. So if we look at um, 1427 in terms of its age model, then um, we, we can actually use that, you know, even though the relationship is flipped, we can use that to start to create independent age model. Um, and here we've kind of uh, splice together the indicators of when we have the Shima warm currents come, come in and out, uh, different biostratigraphic events, and, and also TEFRA. And we see that when we make that comparison between our record and 1426, there's some there's a relatively good correlation between the two, although there are points in which they are, you know, they don't match like for like, and that's kind of to be expected. Uh, but we can make this comparison based on these, um, certainly these TEFRA tire points. So if we then think about it in terms of 1424 um, and the differences in ages, um, you know, at the top here, we have the Lusiki Ramo curve. Um, we're using a kind of the B star value here. Um, in red is uh, 1427. So that's that real coastal uh, record. And then uh, blue is 1426 based on our age model from 1427. You can see there's quite a relatively good comparison here. Um, and you can see that what 
the kind of interglacial glacial changes you see within um, the Lissiki Remo curve, we can see that, that we have uh, pretty good comparisons in terms of um, our B star value, so this productivity value. Then if we take 1426, which is obviously, if you remember, has dark light layering and, and is actually part of the interbasin comparison to 1424, that has a completely separate age model to 1427. When we make that comparison um, between 1426 on the age model from uh, the shallows versus 1426 versus the 1424 age model, you can see there is some, some really good correlation between uh, the two sites. Um, and uh, just here just tells you whether you kind of get leads and lags in between the different parts of the basin. And that kind of is only natural in terms of thinking about um, some of the kind of the uncertainties within uh, the different uh, kind of tephras and uh, palomatic tie points, as well as, you know, the oxygen isotopes as well. So, you know, the maximum difference is, is, is probably about 20,000 years in terms of leads and lags. So that kind of brings us on to kind of a, a big kind of multi proxy reconstruction at 1427, um, where, you know, we see switches in, in terms of the East Asian summer monsoon um, and uh, this is quite a uh, kind of a psychedelic uh, diagram, but um, in what we see is a number of features. At the top here, we have this kind of long-term eccentricity, and then we have this insulation curve. This is uh, a cave, the cave record. So this is Sambo Cave. GT thirty-two percent is um, this is the kind of spliced lowest record in terms of uh, particles less than thirty-two microns I think uh, and then this is uh, the magnetics from that record as well as the inorganic carbon um, and so you know the record I want you to kind of focus in on here is the, the B star and the L star record from uh, and then obviously the these are planktonic species percentages and what we've seen is a switch between dominance of East Asian summer monsoon um, and that's the most intense during marine isotope stages 5e 7e 9e and 11e and this is when the Dishima warm current flowed into an un unrestricted, well mixed, normally saline Japan Sea. Um, so at this point here, so if we look at kind of the sea level curve, this is the point at which we start to get a really fully mixed, um, unrestricted flow into the Japan Sea here. So the earlier parts of the interglacial are where we see the most influence of the summer monsoon on the system. Then when we get to marine isotopes, say two, four, six, and eight, and this is when we start to see the sea level minima. So these points here, this is when we see dominance of the East Asian winter monsoon, um, when we see um, a restriction of, of, of flow into the Japan Sea, we get low salinity oxygen and oxygen conditions in the absence of that flow. So reduced stratification and low salinity and changes in productivity characterize the terminations of these things. So what we're seeing is that we're getting to this minima here, and then we start to see uh, probably subtle changes in the ice sheet um, and uh, uh, start of a rise in sea level. And then as that occurs, you get to a point where we start to see the terminations having an effect within, um, within the Japan Sea. So um, when we compare that to the kind of the lowest cave and uh, lake records from Japan, um, it suggests that the East Asian sun monsoon intensification during low to high insulation transitions, whereas strongest East Asian winter monsoon prevailed during the lowest insulation periods or, or high to low insulation transitions. Um, ice sheet and CO2 forcing leads to the strongest East Asian winter monsoon events in glacials and enhanced East Asian summer monsoon indications. So uh, depending on where you are within the insulation cycles really depends on how strong the effect of the East Asian summer monsoon and the East Asian winter monsoon is within our system. And this kind of, you know, kind of cartoon form highlights, you know, what we think is happening at the different points. So this is when we get this kind of transition from low to high insulation and insulation minima, we see winter monsoon, um, impact so increased sea ice across the japan sea this restricts restricted cold low salinity low oxygen we then get to the terminations where we still have the impact of the east asian sun monsoon but we start to see a weak toshima or east 
um, East China Sea coastal water enter through the Tsushima Strait as sea level rises. Um, and then at our peaks within our interglacials, we get a transition from high to low insulation and we get an open, well mixed, normal saline Japan Sea where we see lots of interaction through the um, East China Sea coastal waters as well as the uh, Tsushima warm water and the impact of East Asian summer monsoon. So, you know, we've talked about it in terms of oceanography, but is there a role for westerly circulation? Obviously, we have kind of these ocean atmosphere dynamics. Um, and we know that the westerly jet transports dust from the Taklaman Desert to all over the northern hemisphere. And this is just a, a model of dust from, so the Taklamakan is here. Uh, this is the Tibet Plateau here. This is in Mongolia. And this dust is moved via the westerly flow around the globe. Now we sit right here in the Japan Sea. Um, and this is kind of the different altitudes and this just, just demonstrates the difference in the altitude of where the, the dust is. So the question is, do we, do we see evidence of this kind of westerly jet circulation impact? You know, one of the key things about this, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is that where the westerly jet sits, north or south of the plateau, is really dependent on stadial versus interstadial. But we can actually see stadial versus interstadial positions on, a, on, a, on an annual cycle. So when we get to spring in April, the jet is much further south of the, of the Tibetan plateau. But then as, as we get to June, um, so May, we start to see it transition north. So this is called pre may And then when it gets to, uh, to May or June, the jet is north of the Bent Plateau. And then in the summer, the jet is well north of them. So we see this switch seasonally. So the question is, do we see periods of time where we see its normal position sitting further north and south um, through time? Now, the westerly jet flows to the south of the Himalaya during autumn to winter, and then it jumps to the north of of Tibet during spring to summer. And it's this, it's the topographic effect of the Tibetan plateau that creates this two distinct circulation mode. So this has an impact in terms of when you have changes heating um, in terms of the plateaus, how does that control the jet stream? But also on longer time scales, if we think about the uplift of the plateau, how does that impact um, how does that impact the actual initiation of the monsoon and actually the kind of the, the, the Japan Sea Basin in terms of East Asian summer monsoon? So when the plateau wasn't there, did we see changes in the same sort of changes in the westerly jet or actually did we, once you put up a plateau into its atmosphere, you start to see the initiation of the westerly jet. So uh, a, a study that kind of tries to prove this in terms of uh, you know, points of concept, it, it says that you know, this is kind of L star, so this is the light dark layering from this is a that um, Marion de Frankel we were talking about earlier, where we looked at the um, looked at the L star. Um, the West jet position and East Asian ones are closely linked on that interannual to millennial time scale. So what we're seeing here when we have it up here is the Taklaman Desert, where we have it down here is the Gobi Desert. So to, depending on where the Westerly jet sits. Um, this is the kind of diameter of the silt fraction. And what, and what we see here, this is kind of GISP2. So we're seeing um, dust being sourced from the Taklaman Desert. So the Westerly Jet is further north when we have an interglacial and we have it further south when it comes from the Mongolian Gobi Desert during a kind of a interglacial or interstadial. So it's possible that the Westerly Jet is also playing a role in terms of not only driving what's delivered to the Japan Sea, but it, it, it has a role in teleconnecting what happens in the North Atlantic to the East Asian summer monsoon system that sits over the Japan Sea. Um, and so this is possibly one of the reasons why we see these imprints of changes that we would see in the North Atlantic that are actually impacting the Japan Sea. So with that, um, I just want to kind of quickly summarize and conclude that Hopefully, you can understand that Japan Sea is quite a complicated system as a result of its unique setting as a marginal semi-enclosed basin. Global patterns of temperature change are recorded in its sediments, but more complex because of the ongoing evolution of the pull-apart basin. Um, and high-resolution changes in Pleistocene reflects glacial interglacial changes and the interaction of the East Asian summer monsoon and the East Asian winter monsoon. 
So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Andy. It was really enlightening, all the information yeah. uh, given from so far away from here. Yeah. But also very relevant for uh, our region. I, I opened the podium for any anybody that wants to ask questions. I don't see anybody. I don't see all of you. So just uh, pop in and bother. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have a question. Did, did you compare, maybe I have um, missed that, but did you compare the data with uh, the data coming from I mean, the data from the Japan Sea with the data from the Indian Ocean? No, not yet. No, um, it's one of the th one of the things some of the scientists who are on 346 were also in some of the Indian Ocean cores. And there it's one of the things that we, we need to do, um, particularly the Bay of Bengal and seeing what yeah, happens exactly. in the Bay of Bengal. Um, because uh, you know we haven't we haven't drawn that comparison yet because we've just been focusing on trying to get the records out from the Japan Sea, but I think yeah. that's something that we will do. Or even even with uh, this this China Sea, there is another in front uh, in front of the Ganges, I think, somewhere over there. Yeah, the Arabian the Sea. Yes. Yeah, uh, so there's yeah, a number. There's been so the, that Japan Sea one was. A, a, expedition was part of a, a much wider initiative by ODP to go to different areas impacted by the monsoon. So there was the Arabian Sea, there's been two or three in, so we have the Bay of Bengal and then you have the Andaman Sea and then you have down near the Maldives. Yeah. And you have the South China Sea as well. So there's there's been lots of them and we haven't, there was a last, well, before lockdown I was in Washington last year, where there was an effort to try and bring some of this together, um, but that we haven't produced the paper yet. For, okay, for so you're working on that. Yeah. Okay, looking forward to see see what yes. you see. See if it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, people apparently are shy today. Mm. That's all right. I don't mind. <laughs> but you know. Feel free to contact if there's you know anything comes up. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so Andy, the, I also wanted to know if you want to be in the mailing list for our uh, seminar series. Oh yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So we will keep informed. Mm -hmm. Since uh, we are still in the Zoom period, we have people coming from New York until China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure Pretty that you will find. I mean, one thing I would say just to advertise as well is um, there is a, a, a monsoon seminar series of, if people are interested in the monsoon. Um, it's an international one that's organized by Peter Clift. And uh, there's, there's a website, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but they, they, they're having weekly seminars from around the world. So, um, so lots of colleagues are, are are kind of giving similar seminars, but you know, it's all to do with all sorts of monsoons from, you know, really deep time ones to really recent ones from land to ocean. So um, yeah. if people are interested, I can, I can send you the details. Yeah. 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 I, I think I did send the details, but I will resend them. Yeah. Okay. 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 Andy. So enjoy the rest of the day with Thank the you. holidays. Yeah. And you, and you lot as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Have a good bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.